Uh, good morning. And please will you turn in God's Word to Genesis chapter 12. Uh, just to mention, if you see us fiddling with the earpiece here, it's because the little elastic thing that's meant to bind it fast to your head has snapped, and so it's just a little bit loose and uh, tends to, to adjust itself, so uh, that, that's why you see us adjusting it up here, and I'm sure we'll fix that in due course. Uh, but we're in Genesis 12. Um, this evening, I'm going to be at Cryford Tame Baptist uh, preaching there, and I'll be preaching from the second half of this passage, uh, and then I'll preach the message I'm preaching at Cryford Tame next week here. Uh, so in my mind, I'm, I'm well entrenched in Genesis 12 now, and I've got a lot more to say than I, than I could actually say in the time given to us. But it really is a, a glorious passage of um, the faith of Abram, uh, the outworking of that faith and the imperfections of that faith as well, which we'll come to next week. I'm going to read from verse 1 just for context, and I'll read down to verse 9. My burden this morning is verses 4 to 9. Though. Genesis 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you... And make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going towards the Negev. Will you pray with me? And then in my praying, I'm also just going to commit our brother Sapelo, uh, who is uh, going to be heading to the Eastern Cape soon. And we're not sure if you're going to be back in Cape Town or not. Uh, depends on some decisions that need to be made then. But we just want to thank you. Uh, for your service to the church, and we hope we see you again. Uh, but let me pray for you as well as we commit this time to the Lord's Word. Our Father in heaven, this is your Word. It is the guiding rod that you use in our lives. It is the, the bread of heaven with which you feed our faith. It is that which you use to sanctify us by your Spirit. And we thank you for it, and we ask for insight into it. We thank you, Lord, that by your word you do guide your servants, and as our brother Sapelo goes to new pastures, as he uh, sets out uncertain of what the future holds, that you would go with him as well and bless him in the decisions that he must make and give him wisdom, even as we would pray that for ourselves, Lord. We are all to collectively uh, sojourners. We are strangers and exiles in this world, and we are destined for a better world, all those of us who are in Christ. And we do pray that you would, by your word and by your spirit, guide our feet into your will and according to your ways, uh, for your name's sake. Amen. A couple of years ago, I placed an order online for something or other. I forget what it was. And on the day of delivery, I was pleasantly surprised to receive the option to be able to track the progress of the courier on his way to my door. I just uh, clicked on the link, and a whole map popped up with live, real-time tracking. There was even a little photo, a little face of the, uh, a photo of the driver's face smiling up at me from the digital vehicle as it moved along on the screen. And I could see where he stopped at the traffic lights and where he turned onto the freeway. And when he came into my neighborhood, the, the whole thing seemed to be piggybacking on Google Maps or something like that and having the satellite image of events as they unfolded. I mean, th this was great. I knew exactly where things stood. And basically, when he would arrive, 
Moment by moment, meter by meter, I was informed. And so as he drew near, I didn't even wait for the sound of the engine outside. I just took note of where he was relative to my house, and I stepped outside at the exact moment that he came around the corner. He didn't have to slow down. He could have just thrown it into my arms and kept driving. Of course, he wouldn't do that because that would get him in trouble, but he could have. And I went back inside. I was thoroughly impressed with the service received. I was chuffed at my level of awareness as things unfolded. This was how it should be. And I assumed that was going to be the new industry standard. The problem, from my very impatient perspective, was that it never happened again. And every order I've placed since then, if I've had to do so, it gives a similar notice of pending delivery and often a link. But when I click on that link, it tells me nothing that I don't know already. It promises that I can track my delivery. But when I try to do that, it just says delivery between the hours of 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. And my flesh does not like that. I mean, I rather enjoyed knowing what exactly, when exactly, where exactly. I mean, that's much more convenient to me personally. I can plan my day. I know when to expect things. I know when the promise will arrive. It will come as I intend. And why can't every experience be like the last one? And of course, it occurs to me, as it no doubt does to you, that this is a little bit what we can be like with the promises of God in Holy Scripture. We want a level of awareness that God is not offered. We'd like to know what and where and when, in precise details, please. Subconsciously, we treat the king of the universe like customer service, expecting a level of communication that we set, fulfillment of promises that we can plan around. And it's not enough for us to know that the Lord will help us between the appointed hours, or sometimes in the hour of trial, or between the hour of salvation and the last hour, or at an hour that we do not expect. No, we would like minutes and seconds and milliseconds as well. That would be much more convenient to me, God. And why can't you just tell me? Why can't I have the details? Why is it taking so long? And essentially what we are saying is, I don't want to exercise faith. When really the promise alone should be more than enough for us. It was for Abram, though later he had more than one speed wobble along the way, we'll get there. But last week we saw that he received a call that would require outstanding faith, and one which came with a host of mighty promises for future blessing. Now we see that faith in action, at least for the immediate context, for a season. And I have four points as we go through the text. Two of them are not explicitly written in the text, but they relate to the text. They arise from the text. And then two that are far more directly that follow. The first point is this. An effectual calling such as is always required for God's chosen. It's almost casually stated there in verse 4. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. He's just received a costly, a life-changing command to follow the invisible God in radical contrast to the culture around him. So Abram went. Just like that. And while in no way diminishing the role of faith, I'll come to that, it does beg the question, why? Why did Abram have it in himself to obey at all? Why would a rich, well-established pagan leave his comfortable life and embark on this journey into the unknown? For that matter, why does anyone ever repent and believe the gospel message? Why does anyone follow Christ against the grain, the expectations, the ideologies of our postmodern society? Someone says, well, uh, it's because he had faith. Yes, obviously. But why? Why does he have faith? Why can there be two similar people, even two identical twins, 
with the exact same upbringing, and one of them hears the call, hears the word of God, and they know conviction and repentance, and they cry out for mercy, and they fall on their knees, and they worship this Jesus Christ, and the other just shrugs their shoulders, puts their feet up, and carries on without a care in the world. Why the difference? And while it's a huge question, we'll narrow it down to just this issue of a call to faith and just a tiny part of what Scripture teaches about it. Clearly, the Bible calls people, calls all people to faith in God. The message of the gospel goes out to all the nations saying, repent and believe the good news. But equally clearly, having heard that message, not all people will respond to that call with saving faith. And the reason for this is that the spiritually dead cannot raise themselves to spiritual life. The spiritually dead, blind, deaf, and enslaved cannot of themselves unilaterally with a wise decision simply choose to become alive, seeing, hearing, and free. Uh, Romans 3, Ephesians 2, many passages make this clear. We are naturally dead in our trespasses and sins, and dead means dead. It doesn't mean you have enough life in you to, to claw your way out of the grave. So there has to be something or someone that makes the call that reaches our ears to be effective, to penetrate the hard-hearted human unbelief. Specifically, there has to be some divine, supernatural element, some spiritual working of God inside a person so that the outer call becomes an inward call, an effectual call so that they can respond with faith. A work of the Holy Spirit that is not engineered by music or by emotionalism or by intellectual persuasion, but which comes about for no other reason than the pleasure of the sovereign God. That's what we're talking about. In the words of Romans 8, 29, those whom God predestined, He also called, called effectively, powerfully, effectually. Those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Did did you see? It is the choice of God before time and creation that leads to the effectual calling in the present, a transformation of the soul from spiritual death to spiritual life. So yes, many will hear the outward call, to believe. Many will grow up with it in the church with it ringing in their ears, or they will read about it in books, or they will hear it from their parents, or they will be presented sermon clips on YouTube. They will hear the call to repent and believe. However, in the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew twenty-two fourteen, many are called, few are chosen. Only God Himself, by His eternal Spirit, can make that call to be effective. And and never, never forget that as you read of Abram and his faith. By all means, let's honor him as a man of faith. We dare not do otherwise. And yes, let's learn from his faith. We will do that in a minute. But never lose sight of this. Between the call of verse 1, go from your country and your kindred... And the response of verse 4, so Abram went, between those two great moments in history, there was an invisible working of God born out of an eternal decision to choose the pagan Abram out of all the nations of the earth. Abram did not choose himself. And the same is true to this day. In order for an outward calling to become an effectual calling in order for a stubborn, proud, critical, or indifferent sinner to actually respond, to surrender their rebellious unbelief and wayward living, the action of God is always required. Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this was not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are 
His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So that's the first point arising from the text, related to the text. Secondly, though, an extraordinary calling such as is really repeated in all history. What, and what I mean is that the calling of Abram has certain rare and repeat, uh, unrepeatable qualities. Verse 1 says that God somehow spoke directly, verbally, audibly to Abram. And verse 7 tells us that God somehow visually appeared to Abram. And this, this is remarkable. As far as we know, it's the first time in 2,000 years since the Garden of Eden that, that God has done this. God spoke to Cain, and he spoke to Noah, but he appeared to Abram, was seen by Abram. So an extraordinary moment, as are the other occasions in Abram's long life where he does it again, where God speaks with an audible voice, where he appears with a visible physical manifestation, a theophany, or he communicates by some vision. Now, when you read of these things, if we take note of what God is actually saying in those instances, then we're on the right track. But if we look at what is happening to Abram and then conclude that that is how it's going to happen to us as well, we've totally missed the point. There are some things that the Bible describes without prescribing them, without making them normative. In other words, sometimes the Bible is saying, this is what happened. It's not saying, go and do likewise and expect it to happen to you. Now, when you read of Peter walking on the water, God is not saying that you can skip swimming lessons and expect to do likewise. It's describing something. It's not prescribing it. When you read that Joshua marched seven times around Jericho on the last day, God is not saying go march seven times around your neighborhood and drive out evil spirits. When Peter raised Dorcas to life in Acts 9, God is not telling you to do what an old friend of mine did and stand up in a funeral and command the deceased to rise and walk again. He really did that. Not the walking part, but the guy who stood up and said do it. It didn't happen. You don't take what is described and make it a command. You don't take an, a miraculous event and make it commonplace, make it normal. That would be to foolishly abuse the text and to strip the unique significance of that recorded moment. Look again at verses 2 and 3. You see, this man Abram, he was not just a regular Joe believer like you or I. I mean, sure, he was like us in that he was a sinner needing grace, yes. But in the purposes of God, he would occupy a, uh, occupy a place of somewhat different prominence to the average Christian. He would play a greater role than most in the plan to bring the Messiah into the world. The promises and blessings that were granted directly to Abram, that they, they were unusual. They, they were unprecedented. They were specific relating to that plan of redemption, the plan to bring Jesus uh, the Messiah. So I ask you, would it not be extremely arrogant to assume that our role will be as great as his? That God will similarly speak audibly and appear visually to us as though we were Abram? Would it not be a terrible presumption to think that we are so important in the unfolding of God's plans that we warrant more revelation than Scripture has given us? Sure, I know the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John, says Jesus, speaking of the privileges that we enjoy under the new covenant. But God, but Jesus was not saying that all the extraordinary events in the lives of Noah and Abram and Moses and David and Elijah and Elisha and others would now somehow become routine occurrences. He was not saying that we would occupy positions of equal importance in God's dealings in history. So to hear with Abram, this is an extraordinary calling. It is beyond ordinary. The Lord's audible speaking and visual appearing to Abram was not going to be commonplace. It was not going to be regularly repeated. Quite the opposite. It would be exceedingly rare, even in biblical times. 
in the 175 years of Abram's life, nearly two centuries, that there are only a handful of key critical occasions when God does this, sometimes separated by decades in between. And likewise for the other major characters of the Old Testament. Few of them could claim any such miraculous event or moment as Abram could. And fewer still could claim it more than once. We, we may read of them in rapid succession when skimming through the pages of our Bible, given the impression that they're happening all the time, one after the next, look, miracle, 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 always. No. In, in that reading, we are passing over centuries of normality as well. And listen now, for the vast, vast majority of ordinary biblical believers in those thousands of years of recorded history, there were not voices from heaven and visions in the night and manifestations of angels and supernatural occurrences. They, like us, had to work and farm and travel and raise their kids and go about their lives with something far less sensational and far more common. They had to live with faith. The very thing for which Abram is commended and remembered in the pages of the New Testament. It doesn't say, oh, remember Abram who had all those miraculous moments. No, it says remember his faith. And that brings us to the third point. Now we're getting closer to the direct text and not just matters related to it, but a faith that waits and works, trusting and obeying. So Abram went, as the Lord uh, has told him, and there are details about his companions and his journey. Apart from Sarai, his wife, Lot, his nephew, is also along for the ride, and he will play a, a part in the events that follow. Now, you may be wondering about these, the order of things here. It might not be immediately clear. But since Acts chapter 7, the great call and promise of verses 1 to 3 came to Abram before he lived in Haran, while he was still in Ur of the Chaldeans. And he obeyed that call. He left Ur. And then, says Genesis 11, he stopped midway briefly uh, in Haran, where his father, Terah, would die. And now, says Genesis 12, age 75 years old, Abram leaves Haran, and he continues on his journey. You may ask, well, why doesn't the Bible lay it out for us chronologically in the first place? And the answer is that back in chapter 11, it's focusing on Terah's life and the order of events in his life. And now it is focusing on Abram with some overlap, but without repeating all the details. So Abram and Sarai and Lot, they having had the call, Abram, uh, they now leave Haran sometime afterwards with all their possessions and those traveling with them. And they take something of a, a tour down the Holy Land, ancient Israel, the land of Canaan. Haran was far to the north, so that's the direction they're coming from, moving south. They pass through the land, verse 6, arriving at Shechem, more or less in the middle of Canaan. And there the Lord appears telling Abram that this was the land that would belong to his offspring, to later generations. Then they move down, down still further, the length of the land, east of Bethel, and they keep traveling still further to the southern parts and the Negev. Now why didn't Abram just simply stop somewhere along the way and settle permanently? Verse 6, because the Canaanites were in the land, and they wouldn't take kindly to Abram just taking over. But there's more than just that, because behind this earthly problem of the Canaanites was a heavenly decree that it was Abram's descendants that would inherit the land, not Abram himself. Abram would sojourn. He would live as a stranger, a foreigner here, as the literal wording of Hebrews 11 has it. So this land, which God has given him in this momentous moment, would be Abram's land by right of promise but not yet by actual experience, or rather Abram's offspring. His by right of promise, but not by actual experience. And imagine how that must have been for him, to have to take this long, slow journey, camping each night under the stars, waking each morning to new sights and wonders. And as he looks around him, he sees mountains and fields, hill country to the east, 
The walled cities along the coast, olive groves, fig trees, vineyards full of grapes and clear running waters. He sees the the sun setting over the Mediterranean Sea and the, the lushness of this land that is later described as flowing with milk and honey, a whole inheritance for his offspring. And he gazes on it with excitement. And he knows it's promised to his family, and yet he himself would not enter into the full experience of that promise. He would not be able to enjoy the blessing to the utmost, while simultaneously he would be surrounded by wicked Canaanites who did, who possessed the land and yet neither honored the Lord nor gave him thanks. That was the peculiar tension of Abram's living here promised to him and yet not possessed by him, he would have to wait. And if you are a Christian, this might sound somewhat familiar, and you don't have to do much imagining. Because our circumstances are much the same. We too live in a world, a whole creation, that is promised by divine decree to the church of Jesus Christ. A world that will be restored and renewed to even greater glory than the glory of Eden and then given to Christians in the new creation. And yet it is a world which by and large is not presently ours to enjoy. And we must wait. Uh, we, We might carve out a few square meters of land and stack some bricks upon one another to make a house and plant some plastic grass... We might own the the few top layers of dirt for a quarter acre or less without even having the deeper mineral rights and still have to pay rates and taxes on the land that you own. But the greater glory of the whole earth, and indeed the whole universe, is not yet in our possession, nor is it meant to be in this present age. God has promised it to his bride for the age to come, when the meek shall indeed inherit the earth, And the new creation comes into its fullness at the declaration of Jesus Christ. But for now, for here, we, like Abram, just live with a promise. In fact, and some of you might not like this, but really we live with the same promise. Because Hebrews 11 and Galatians 3 tells us that that Abram's understanding of this promise of land looked far, far beyond the boundaries of Israel and Canaan, and he saw it as being for a heavenly country with his Gentile spiritual offspring included side by side with believing Jews. So take your eyes off the Prophecy Watch channels. Uh, Get away from from all the the articles and fear-mongering about the Middle East and lift them heavenward. Lift them to the heavenly country that Abraham took this promise to mean and enter into the same hope that he had. You don't have a big house by the sea. It doesn't matter. You won't be able to afford that trip to that island getaway and those scenic azure waters and beaches. All that pilgrimage you always wanted to take into Jerusalem. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter if you can't go. You're forced to rent because you can't afford the escalating property prices in our city, take heart. 20, 30, 40 years from now, you will enter your heavenly country of a whole rebirth new creation in which there are no taxes, bureaucrats, bureaucrats, bylaws, wars, pain, suffering, borders, or even the need for money, because it all belongs to Christ and His bride, the church. I often say to my family, you know, we won't be able to go there or see that or visit all these different wonders in this fading world, but we'll do it all and we'll do more in the world to come. And the best of all is that we will see the Lord. Won't that be a glorious day? So Abram waited. He waited as we must wait, and he walked by faith in the promises of God. It was not a perfect faith, and we'll see that next Sunday, but it was noteworthy with more time given to Abram's faith in Hebrews 11 than anyone else. He did not set conditions for his obedience. He did not attempt to bargain or barter with God. He didn't say, Lord, if you get me out of this problem, then I will obey your call. 
No, he believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, says Genesis 15. He was Abram the man of faith, or Abram the believer, or Abram the faithful, says Galatians 3 verse 9. His faith was active. It was working. It wasn't idle. It wasn't nominal. James 2 makes the powerful point that Abram's faith produced works, and that without those works, any claim to saving faith would be worthless. It would amount to zero, zip, zilch, nada, because true faith bears fruit of an active Christianity, trusting, obeying, repenting, seeking, following Christ the way Abram did. Again, not perfectly, not without falls and stumbles, but certainly there is a a visible sincerity that walks before the Lord and waits on the Lord and works out one's salvation with fear and trembling, recognizing that it is God who works in us to both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Faith is required. A faith that works and grace is required to make that faith work, which the Lord freely bestows. And then the fourth and final point is simply this. A faith that worships and witnesses, seeking and proclaiming. Abram was neither shy nor quiet about his faith. When we think about him as being almost alone in his beliefs in that ancient world, surrounded by these idol worshippers, the Canaanites, and, and waiting for the promise, we must not think of him as being a holier-than-thou recluse, a hermit, an isolationist with, uh, with an intense self-interest and no concern for anyone else. It, we mustn't think of him as like a, an end times crackpot who carts his family off to the Middle East or to the middle of Karoo to, to prepare for Armageddon, you know, bottle water and batteries in the garage. Look at verses 6 to 7 for starters. While at Shechem, we're told that he came to the Oak of Morah, what, what is this? Well, the word we have translated oak is the word for terebinth tree. And the word mora, which is clearly a place, is the Hebrew word for oracle giver or teacher. So simply put, the oak of mora was a place of ancient Canaanite ritual and worship, a place of pagan divination and fortune telling, telling as was common in the dark days of the Old Testament history. Even sometimes in Israel's history, uh, God rebukes them for desiring the oaks and terebinth trees in Isaiah 129. Uh, this is where uh, mystic revelation was sought and otherworldly trances were entered into. Uh, they, they went there, they wanted to have some of that oracle giving, prophecy making sensationalism, that ecstatic religious experience that the Canaanites used to have, dancing around the trees until they had visions and dreams for themselves. It says Hosea 4.13, they sacrifice on the tops of the mountains and burn offerings on the hills under oak, poplar, and terebinth because their shade is good. And that's the sort of thing that was common to the land where Abram was now, uh, now found himself. Verse 6, the land of Shechem, the land of Canaan. So verse 7, what does Abram do here? He builds an altar to the Lord to Jehovah. Instead of climbing on the bandwagon of mass, euphoria, and hysteria, Abram sets up a place of bloody atonement, a sacrifice for sin, a place of death and remembrance of the living God, in stark contrast to the beliefs of those around him. Abram worships the Lord. He worships openly and publicly, the, the smoke of his offering rising to the heavens, filling the air with the aroma of burning. He's unashamed. He's openly declaring that the Lord God Almighty is greater than all these false gods of trees and rivers and mountains and weather. And he's declaring that the revelation from Jehovah in that promise is greater than the oracle-making imaginations of the Canaanites as they follow their feelings and impulses and dreams under the terebinth tree. But keep reading, because in verse 8 he does it again. In the hill country, near Bethel and Ai, 
Bethel was a place of worship for the Canaanite god El. Uh, the Canaanite god El was uh, the head of the Canaanite pantheon of gods. He was kind of like Zeus was for the Greeks. And here Abram comes along and he builds another altar. And we're told there that he calls upon the name of the Lord. Uh, a word that is also translated proclaimed the name of the Lord. And we spoke about this before back in Genesis 4. To call or proclaim the name of the Lord carries the idea of both worship and witness. It speaks to a public confession that the Lord is God and a living before Him in, in such a way and obeying Him that, that marks one as different from the surrounding culture, the pagan culture, the Canaanite culture, the Capetonian culture. It involves a declaration of His worth, His character, His attributes, who God is, what He is like, what He requires, what He has done. This is what Abram is doing east of Bethel in the sight of the Canaanites. He proclaims the name of the Lord his God, because how could he not? This very great God who has done so much for him. Now, when and where and how exactly he went about this somewhat evangelistic outreach look to his living, I don't know. Uh, I, I, he wasn't invading the shrines and smashing the idols, but certainly his faith was not silent. It wasn't passive. He lived it. He sought the Lord. He made sure that others knew that the Lord was his God. And how different this was from the Babelites uh, that he, he came from. Remember, that, that's his culture that he came from, Babel. Um, Ur, Mesopotamia, Shinar, the land of Abel. They had built a tower to make a name for themselves, but now Abram builds an altar to proclaim the name of the Lord, not himself. And in fact, back in verse 5, that little line and the people that they had acquired in Haran, a casual reading might have us thinking it means slaves. But the word people there is not the word for slave. It is, in fact, the word for life or soul, implying a spiritual connotation. Those people are quiet, perhaps being converts, proselytes, new believers who came to believe in the God of Abram. Not many, perhaps only a handful, but some, or as one commentator has translated it, the souls they had won in Haran. This was the, the fruit of Abram's faith. It was worshiping, and it was witnessing. And it demonstrates something to us, doesn't it? It shows that biblical faith is not just me and Jesus, just me and Jesus, no one else, just me and Him. It's very private, you know. That's ridiculous. The faith that God commends is not the pseudo-Christianity of rampant Western individualism, that has nothing to do with others, that makes a church a quick pit stop on Sundays before getting on with one's business. Rather, authentic Christianity actively seeks and worships God and intentionally engages with others around the matter, matters of the gospel. Both other Christians and one's local fellowship, unless you're going to turf out the whole New Testament, and engaging with the lost by way of witness and evangelism. Faith does not close itself up in a tent or lock itself up in a home in a middle-class suburb. No, it worships and it witnesses. It reaches outwards. And if on another occasion, in another part of Scripture, we might call the extrovert to repent of imposing too much of themselves on others. In this part of Scripture, we can certainly call the introvert to repent of not giving enough of themselves to others in the expression of biblical faith. So as we wrap this up and come to a conclusion, let me just say, this is the example of Abram. An example of faith that is waiting and working and worshiping and witnessing. And there are ample encouragements and commands for the Christian to do likewise as we sojourn in this dying world with our fleeting lives. Psalm 27 encourages us, wait for the Lord. 
Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Ephesians 2 speaks of the works that God has prepared beforehand for us to walk in. Hebrews 10 says, Do not neglect the assembling together of the saints, but to encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day of Christ drawing near. We, we serve the Lord in this world while waiting for the next. This is not a holiday. As someone has said, the world is not a playground. It is a battleground. 1 Corinthians 10 reminds us of the lifestyle of worship with which all Christians must approach their living, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, doing all to the glory of God. So in our jobs, our homes, our schools, our varsities, our churches, on the sports field, amongst friends, amongst enemies, we are to be ambassadors for Christ. We proclaim His name. We pray for workers to enter the great harvest. How will they call on him whom they have not believed and how are they to believe on him of whom they have never heard and some of our efforts and take note of this if you're expecting instant results some of our labors will not see fruit in our lifetime but only in the years and years that follow both scripture and church history is full of examples of Christians who plodded along being faithful year after year, decade after decade, and the fruits of their labors were reaped by generations that came after them and not themselves. Sometimes in the providence of God, our own part is smaller than we would like to imagine, and it is the next person who will see the results that we long for, one sowing, another watering, but the Lord ultimately giving life whensoever he desires. And this is something that is near impossible for our impatient culture to understand, conditioned as we are to instant everything. Fast food, real time, quick access, instant coffee, same day delivery, priority, priority boarding, live tracking, couriered straight to my door. Uh, God has bound himself to no such terms and conditions or obligations. People may set their plans and programs and visions and ambitions, but the Spirit works and goes wherever and whenever he wills. And if history is any judge, most often he works slower than Western man would like and is accustomed to, and quite independently of our schemes. And it is the simple things, the humble means of prayer, and gospel proclamation, and Christian love one to another, and faith in the face of trial. This is how God is pleased to grow a Christian and to advance his kingdom. We must learn from Abram, waiting for the promise, his eyes on heaven, his feet on earth, his walk with God. And know as you do so that the greatest glory of all, our highest anticipation, our most fervent hope, is not in the land, not in the land of Israel, not even in the new creation itself, or whatever riches or wonders await there, but rather it is in beholding the glory of the triune God whom Abram heard and Abram saw. It is to live with this great God in the everlasting ages to come. That's what excited Abram more than herds and lands and houses and holidays and camels and cars. That's what he lived for. He and Sarai died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles here on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land out of which they had gone, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Will you pray with me? And next week we'll continue with the story of Abram and his faith. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for putting the spotlight on the faith of this, your servant, Abram. 
We confess, as we always must when we come to Scripture, that these things do show us up somewhat, and the nearer we, nearer we draw to the light, the more uh, we notice our own marks and infirmities, our spiritual shortcomings. And so we ask you, Lord, that with that same powerful working of your Spirit that effectively called Abram, that you would effectively work in our lives to sanctify us and to make us to be servants that are willing and working and waiting and worshiping and witnessing until the day that you come for us or the day that we are taken uh, to glory. We ask, Father, for grace as we must always do, uh, for we feel our fleshly weakness, even as Abram would be shown to be only a man, and we'll look at that soon. But Lord, we pray, as always, for your help. In Jesus' name, amen.